and that the statements made to the witness by the court and the prosecutor were acting in concert about the amount of time that Mr. Copeland could be held in custody on contempt. So if you don't talk, if you don't tell us what we want you to say, we're gonna hold you in custody for a long time. Currently, we know the judge has, guess what? Denied the motion to recuse himself. I'm going to make that, I'll reduce both of the motions to recuse to an order, and I will file that so you can take whatever steps you need to necessarily Good. after that. Judge Glanville gets hit with a motion to recuse. It's brought by Brian Steele, who delivered it very casually in an ominous drop-off the day before we got to read the motion. This is what it looked like, a courtesy copy. Brian, middle name, probably balls of or man of, is now dropping the motion off. It's a motion to recuse Judge Glanville, and it gives us a nice summary of everything that's happened in here. So if you're just catching up to speed on this trial, getting up to speed like we are. We're going to see what happened and assemble all the backstory before we hear how the judge rules on the motion to recuse. Now, this is the scene when Brian Man of Steel came in and showed up in front of the judge and the courtroom and just very casually dropped off these filings. Everyone's taking a look at this. What is this? This looks fun. All right, now they're all realizing this is a big, big one. Motion to recuse, they're gonna look through it and it is quite good. So let's just dig right into it. The motion gets dropped off. Brian Steele, the Steele Law Firm, submits this one after just wild ordeal. You see, we've got a bunch of exhibits, but Brian Steele, the Steele Law Firm out of Atlanta, Georgia. Keith Adams also joining in on this, signing off on it. Big filing, 27 pager, all in an attempt to recuse and to disqualify Judge Glanville from all further dealings in the above reference case. It's a motion for a mistrial, which was goaded by the improper conduct committed in concert by the court and the prosecution. Whew, that is a fun title. So a lot of background on this is going to be incorporated into this filing. Let's see what happens. They say undersigned counsel, Mr. Brian Steele, represents Mr. Jeffrey Williams in this case. Now the jury trial accused multiple persons commenced back on January 4th, 2023 in front of Judge Glanville, multiple felonies. The trial is expected to last at least through the end of 2024, this entire year. Now on Monday, June 10th, within five days of filing this timely motion, this court, along with the prosecutors, engaged in an unlawful, improper ex parte meeting with, among other persons, a sworn witness called Kenneth Copeland, for whom an order of use immunity had been issued on Friday, June 7th. So we have a meeting. There is an ex parte meeting. So the ex parte means it's between between basically the judge and one party. It could be either the defense or the prosecution. In this case, it was the prosecution. So the judge, the prosecutor are meeting. They're not notifying the defense about this. This is a big problem. Both sides should be there. It's only ex parte for very rare things. And there was another person who was also in this. Now, normally ex parte meetings are just between a judge and a prosecutor, for example. Like we've seen these being used in the Florida classified documents case. Jack Smith's team will say, Judge Cannon, we got all this classified stuff. We got to show you, blah, blah, blah. So we can't show the other side. And so we'll just show it to you. She says, okay, fine, just send it to me. But what's also strange about this is they also brought in another sworn witness. You're just, well, that's weird, because now the defense is saying, well, I want to have a record of what you talked with this witness about. So a sworn witness called Kenneth Copeland in there, who got some immunity, was also issued. So now they're talking to him about, I guess, the evidence of the case. And the defense is not there. So you're flipping out if you're a defense attorney. It's absolutely insane. So no notice of this ex parte meeting was provided to the attorney. So it's like they're all just having a little secret meeting with a key witness witness who has some immunity and the prosecutor's trying to finagle some evidence against your client. No criminal defense attorneys that were accused in this case, representing defendants accused in this case, were there. In fact, the accused and their counsel were in the dark that this, quote, star chamber meeting even occurred. Mr. Copeland had previously, so this is a witness testifying, previously been called to testify on Friday, June 7th. He comes in. He goes into court. He asserts his Fifth Amendment privilege in open court in front of the jury. I invoke my right to remain silent. I'm not talking at all. So then the judge held him in contempt and they incarcerated him until such time as he agreed to testify. No, you have immunity, says the judge. So you have to testify because they're not going
going to prosecute you for the bad things that you say. So you have to testify you're going into custody. So then Judge Glanville and prosecutors, they essentially admitted by silence and by their statements in open court that an ex parte meeting occurred on the morning of June 10th, only after the undersigned counsel revealed based upon information and belief that this impermissible meeting occurred. So then, right, this guy, the government wants him to testify and say certain things. That's why they gave him immunity. If you say these things, you're going to have immunity. We're going to love you and you're going to make our case. He comes out. I'm invoking. Judge says, well, you're going into jail until you tell us the right thing. So then they glean that they had this ex parte meeting. So the judge is putting pressure on him at this meeting. You better testify. Here's your immunity. They're not going to prosecute you for this, whatever. So the defense catches wind of this. At the earliest opportunity on the afternoon of June 10th, the court was informed based upon information and belief that the ex parte meeting with the sworn witness, Kenneth Copeland, and the prosecution occurred earlier that day. That the witness, right, so the defense team goes, oh my gosh, we now know about this. That the defense team had made factual admissions and that the statements made to the witness by the court and the prosecutor were acting in concert about the amount of time that Mr. Copeland could be held in custody on contempt. So if you don't talk, if you don't tell us what we want you to say, we're going to hold you in custody for a long time. The court denied Brian Steele's request for the transcript of the ex parte meeting. Said, no, you don't get to see what we talked about and denied the timely motion for a mistrial based upon this improper ex parte meeting, which violated my client's constitutional and statutory rights, including the right to due process, to be a part of the process, to have the, a fair proceeding, a fair tribunal, ethical prosecutors in Fulton County. Yeah, right. And the right to be present at every critical stage of the proceedings under the Georgia Constitution. Mr. Steele continues, uniform superior court delineate rules about ex parte communications, judge. It generally prohibits ex parte communications generally, except as authorized by the law or by rule. Judges shall neither initiate nor consider ex parte, your little secret meetings, by interested parties or their attorneys concerning a pending or impending proceeding. In fact, ex parte proceeding hearings are only authorized in cases of extraordinary matters like temporary restraining orders and temporary injunctions, okay? You go to a judge in the middle of the day and say, hey, my ex-husband's gonna try to kill me. Well, I need to have him here so that he has proper notice. He, like, he's like gonna kill me tomorrow. Okay, so we'll have just a temporary restraining order. He has a right to a hearing within 10 days, but we're gonna grant it to you right now. We're gonna have an ex parte proceeding. Obviously he's not here. So tell me what happened. Okay, I'm gonna grant this protective order. You go enforce it, provide notice to him and so on. So like you can do it, but it's in those types of situations. It's not when you have a witness and he's like, I'm not just gonna tell you what you want me to say. In other judicial hearings, both parties should be notified of the hearing so that you can have an opportunity to attend. We have this thing in the constitution called, you know, the confrontation clause, pretty important. It's the idea that you have a right to face your accusers and to be apprised of the process that's being brought against you. So they copy and paste a bunch of this saying here, assuring fair hearings. Here's from the Georgia code of judicial conduct. A judge should be a good judge, right? Don't be a conflicted bad judge who has ex parte communications with people. It's going to disadvantage one side, but the court violated the judicial code. The court has joined the prosecutor's team working against the defense is biased against Mr. Williams and favorable to the prosecutors as demonstrated throughout the pendency of this case saying the reason why this should all be granted a recusal a mistrial and more says the trial court rejected our arguments for information about the unlawful meeting and you also denied our motion for a mistrial we made those arguments instead judge Glanville stunningly demanded to know so he comes out Brian Steele says your honor we know about this meeting I want to know more information give me the transcript so I can read about it the judge flipped said how did you learn about this ex parte meeting I want to know right now the prosecutors stunningly sat mute they permitted this injustice to occur and for the court to attempt to intimidate this counsel later love who is a lawyer currently employed with the DA's office argued that the ex parte hearing with Copeland was ethical was just and it was proper so the government prosecutor who works for Fannie is perfectly fine I don't know if she's sleeping with any other prosecutors or not maybe I don't know the other prosecutor still remained mute maybe they're sleeping together I don't know it's Fulton County I have no idea so maybe she like gave him the old eye you know kind of like Fanny did with Nathan he's like oh crap undersigned counsel declined to join the antics in ignoring rules and ethical provisions and we declined to answer your questions judge why because we have our own ethical rules a lawyer shall maintain confidence and professional relationships and ethical rules state that the attorney client privilege applies to judicial proceedings as well and so I'm bound by the rules to not disclose information under the rules rules. Now the court ignored those rules and continued to demand that Brian Steele reveal
reveal the source of the information, claiming that the way the undersigned counsel obtained that information was somehow unlawful, ridiculous, and baselessly accused undersigned counsel on the record of potentially acquiring the information through eavesdropping, like they hacked their iPhones or something. In response to the specious accusations this defense attorney steal and the impermissible demands, undersigned counsel relied on my ethical rules and the Fifth Amendment. The court, though, is so biased against this counsel and my client that the court ignored all laws and pursued contempt penalties to try to intimidate this defense lawyer, and they did, and threatened him with jail. They said, we're going to throw you in jail. And they did. The court issued a written order of contempt and incarceration for Brian Steele, the defense attorney, imposing the maximum sentence for 20 days. Now, the Supreme Court of Georgia has granted a writ of certiorari to address this appeal, and they've granted a supersedious bond, so he's now out of custody. But the judge ordered him into jail. Now, the court violated the law. This judge should have recused himself from presiding over this contempt proceeding. In these proceedings where the announcement of punishment is delayed and where the contumacious conduct was directed towards the judge or where the judge reacted to the conduct, the judge may give the attorney notice, but the attorney should be heard by another judge. So it should have gone to some other judge. This judge says, no, I've investigated myself. I'm doing a great job. Here, the court involved itself in these proceedings by joining the government's team and conducting the ex parte meeting that violated my client's rights. This created a conflict of interest for the court because its own unethical conduct is questioned and at the very heart of this issue. The court then compounded its abuse of power by presiding over the very contempt hearing which its own rules were broken. The court should have recused. They should have allowed the contempt proceedings to be handled by someone else. And guess what? Did the prosecutors who are there in the interest of justice do anything or say anything about it? No, they work for Fannie. They were thinking about their next cruise. Prosecutors sat mute and permitted the court to attempt to interrogate and intimidate another member of the bar who reported a violation of the law. We're in a post-law America, as we keep saying here, and promoted the court's wrongful conduct by asserting the ex parte meeting was proper. So then the court denied the defense request saying that their due process rights were violated. They denied the right to notice and to be heard, to call hearings, and they just entered in contempt. There was no process at all. Therefore then abused its authority by holding this defense attorney in contempt. Now here's the motion to disqualify. The rules say we have to file that within five days. The Honorable Supreme Court has taught that a motion to recuse is filed timely when we do it like this, and so we've done it like this. Now the record also reveals numerous instances at trial where the judge's behavior is biased against Mr. Williams. The record reveals other instances too where the trial court wrongly berated the attorneys in front of the jury. Now after a number of these incidents, Mr. Steele, out of the jury's presence, moved for the judge's recusal. Says, Your Honor, enough of this. You can't keep doing this. And we seek a mistrial because you are showing a lack of objectivity. You had displayed bias against Mr. Williams and his attorney, Mr. Steele, and had assisted the prosecutors in making their case before the jury. Judges have an ethical duty to disqualify themselves when it becomes overly personal. And the Supreme Court is mindful about this. And prosecutors also must follow their ethics, but they don't either. And so while these several interests come together in this courtroom, we have them attached as Exhibit B. But joint affidavit, however, this exhibit represents more than a mere friction between these lawyers and a judge. No, it's much more serious than this. The judge's conduct created the impression that he harbored ill will towards the lawyers and the defense. Higher courts need not decide whether this bias or impartiality actually existed because judges are ethically bound to disqualify themselves when their impartiality might reasonably be questioned, including in instances where the judge's behavior could indicate he does have a bias. Now, as explained, the trial judge in this case, Glanville, participated in ex parte communications with the government, and he assisted the state to influence a witness to testify. It's almost like a settlement conference, which is what happens with defendants when you're trying to talk to them about taking a plea deal. You bring the judge in, and the judge puts a ton of pressure on them. You know I could do this to you if you don't take this plea deal. You know if you go to trial and lose, you could be facing the maximum standard on the law. So they bring that in, and defense attorneys are at those meetings. So these actions certainly raised reasonable questions concerning the judge's partiality and bias. Why wouldn't the defendant be allowed to be there? Why? Maybe because they shouldn't have been having that meeting. Maybe because the judge should not have been in there putting pressure on that witness. Because the trial judge's impartiality is reasonably questionable, it's an error to deny our request for a recusal. Now, our highest court has set forth three circumstances where recusal is necessary. Mr. Williams does not waive any of that. First, mere appearance of bias requires recusal. Here's two cases that share that one. And Georgia courts have also followed this demand for recusal many times. And also, due process similarly requires a recusal when the judge takes a role in the accusatory process.
process when you become a part of the case itself. Our court has explained that the Constitution prohibits a scenario where the judge orders witnesses to appear before him to gather facts about his own contempt. Yeah, this is because the judge grand jury arrangement caused the judge to become part of the accusatory process, and so the judge must be recused. Here, Judge Glanville has ordered Copeland's lawyer and others to appear to give information on contempt. Same is against the law. And so importantly, a trial judge has a duty to recuse themselves. They have to do it sua sponte, on their own accord. And the phrase is broad. Recusal is objectively required when the judge is both the accuser and the adjudicator in a case. Here, the court met ex parte with the government and a sworn witness, and they never intended to reveal that meeting to the defense. Never. They tried to cover it up. Or to anyone for that matter. So this witness was just going to, I guess, come out and start singing, and then he was going to let him out. The court has become part of the executive branch. They are assisting the government in prosecuting the defense. And moreover, the prosecutors have also abandoned and violated their ethical duties by engaging in this ex parte meeting and by sitting silent while the court attempted to get in there and lace into the defense. And they failed to reveal any Brady evidence as well, right? The government should have said, hey, this meeting happened. It was pretty bad. Including the fact that the meeting occurred. It's total bedlam here. This is one of the most insane things that's happening. The judge was involved in it. The court and the prosecutors should not be working together, but they are, teaming up to gain an unlawful advantage over the defense. Mr. Williams' trial is constitutionally fractured. It's unfair. It lacks all constitutional, statutory, and ethical safeguards. The court is biased against the lawyer as well. No intellectually honest person could believe that coercing a witness to testify in a star chamber setting meets constitutional muster at all. Now, the court has failed to follow the lawful path. Instead, the court has unlawfully become the prosecutor, the judge, grand jury, biased, partial, potential sentencer, and thus he must be removed from the case. It is the duty of a judge to pass only on the legal sufficiency of the items before him. Neither the truth or of the allegations nor good faith may be questioned, but the test is whether there is bias on the part of the judge. Now, this court's conduct raises a strong finding that it has become, meaning you judge, personally embroiled in this case. It's clear, even to a casual observer, that this court's involvement in the controversy requires this court to be disqualified. It's critical to our integrity of our justice system that we have actual fair and impartial judges and jurors. And the rules say that you must mandate, mandate that you must be disqualified. And so this motion is now asking, saying that Glanville should immediately cease to act upon all matters in this case, shall immediately determine the timeliness of these motions and whether recusal should be warranted. The affidavit explains more, but the rules say that an objective observer cannot ignore this. He must be recused. A fair-minded and impartial person would hold a reasonable perception that he lacks impartiality. His conduct gives fair support to a charge of a bent of mind that may impede the impartiality of justice. Saying this indictment must also be dismissed. A mistrial must be granted here. And the prosecution's continued misconduct shown below is in violation of our right to a fair trial. Judge Glanville and lawyers for the state, Prosecutor Love and Hill will be called as witnesses at trial for the jury to determine if this ex parte meeting mattered. And additionally, Mr. Williams demands all ex parte meetings to be disclosed right now in order to properly reveal the full extent of the violations of these laws and ethics. How many other meetings were there that we don't know about? Again, lawyers for the state Love and Hilton and Judge Glanville are necessary witnesses to determine whether this misconduct was goaded by these parties and this judge. This motion is just great. Based upon the above, Above in the affidavit, if Glanville does not immediately recuse from any and all further matters on this case, you must send this motion to another judge to determine why Judge Glanville can continue to serve in this case. And further, a mistrial must be granted for these violations of these ethics. So we've got some exhibits here. This is the order for contempt and incarceration of Brian Steele. So the judge said, you're ordered, you go to jail now. He's going to be taken into custody for 20 days, signed by Honorable Pff, Judge Glanville. And here's exhibit B, joint affidavit of Brian Steele and Keith Adams. He says, okay, we're counsel for Jeffrey Williams here. We're over the age of 18. On Monday, Brian Steele asked for a transcript and the court obstructed Mr. Williams and below affiance from having the exact image of what was said. That obstruction alone shows this court is biased. We wanted to know about your meeting. Was there an actual recording of anything discussed? They said no. There was absolutely no privilege in communications in the court's chambers and there's certainly no attorney client privilege over the stretch of the imagination that this court is trying to assert. And so this obstructionist conduct by this court shows bias, shows that this court is intrigued
intrinsically intertwined in this case, there's no fair trial happening at all. Now this court, by its word, used on the record when speaking in open court with the affiance, as well as the court's silence, as well as lawyer love statements in open court, clearly demonstrate that there was a meeting. So we picked it up from you. This court also silenced witnesses by improperly issuing an order for contempt and making all witnesses in this case fear going to jail. And cross-examination of Ms. Copeland will include facts that occurred at this meeting, which puts the credibility of lawyer love, lawyer Hilton, and this court in issue. And this court should never be the person who is in charge of the jury when the court's conduct is being questioned as well. Miss Williams has been put into a trick box by the misconduct of lawyer love, lawyer Hilton, and the court. And so this court must be recused. Now more from this affidavit. Mr. Kenneth Copeland is a witness who had been called by the state. He was sworn in and he invoked his fifth amendment. He was held in civil contempt and unbeknownst to these attorneys, Mr. Williams or anyone else on the defense side, this court met in chambers with Mr. Copeland, with his lawyer, with his lawyer love, with lawyer Hilton, and a court reporter and sheriff deputies were there as well, but no one told the defense. Deputies might have been instructed to turn off their body cameras. There's nothing privileged about this at all. The court and others met with Mr. Copeland for a lengthy period of time. The total ex parte quote meeting, which was an indoctrination threat session, lasted for more than one hour, maybe two hours, with the above named people at the meeting. Mr. Copeland continued to make his assertion that he would not testify even in the face of being held in contempt. Even if you grant me immunity, I'm not talking. This this court and lawyer for Fulton County, Fanny's office, ignored Copeland's decision and continued to declare Copeland that he would be held in custody until you testify. And if you refuse to testify, he would be held in custody not only until the trial is over, but until all 26 indicted people are all resolved. So basically forever. This court was a participant and was present during these threats to Copeland. This is witness intimidation. It's coercion through and through. The court has become a member of the prosecution team. They're assisting the government. This court, lawyer, Hilton Love, they're all now witnesses to the case and they will be called by Mr. Williams and others so that the jury can determine the demeanor and the credibility of what occurred at this little secret meeting. And please note that the witness list is hereby amended by this joint affidavit to include the prosecutors and everyone else. Now the court also provided Mr. Copeland with a written copy of the statute of perjury. They said, oh, here's the crime that you're committing right now. This is no subtle gesture. This is one that helped the prosecution team obtain their mission to try to get Mr. Copeland to change his mind. This is the lawyer violating. You don't want to violate this law. Look at the penalty. I can sentence you right here. The government lawyer, Love, made representations to this court in front of Mr. Copeland and his counsel and others, and she committed misconduct during his representation. These are known misrepresentations, which lawyer Love continues to do to this court, which biases this court, and she continues to speak ill of counsel in front of the jurors. Now, the ex-party discussion violated Mr. Williams' constitutional rights. This court and the prosecutors spoke with a sworn witness and literally tried to get him to change his mind. These facts are assertions. On Monday, attorney Kayla Bumpus was escorted to the court's chambers with Copeland. So Copeland and Kayla, client and attorney, go in. Those present for the substantive portion of this meeting were Judge Glanville, Mr. Copeland, the witness, attorney Bumpus, lawyers, two prosecutors, Love and Hilton, member of the court security staff, deputies, two investigators from the prosecutor's team, and a court reporter. So how many people is that? Judge, prosecutor, prosecutor, let's say two security people, two deputies, two investigators, so about nine people, and then the other two attorneys are there, right? So the client and the attorney, so like 11 total. So it's the witness, the lawyer, and nine people. So it's a show of force. They bring in the judge. He's in his robe. He's got his authority behind him. They bring in all these law enforcement officials, these government prosecutors. They're trying to scare the crap out of this dude. In chambers, this court asked Mr. Copeland whether he was prepared to testify. Are you ready to testify, sir? He said, no, I'm invoking my Fifth Amendment right. And they said, well, you don't want to do that. A conversation among the parties ensured that Mr. Copeland Copeland understood immunity. You understand what immunity means, right? And how he thought he may testify if he didn't invoke the fifth. Once he learned that he could be held indefinitely by the court if he refused to testify, not just for the two years as he thought initially, he decided that he would testify. Okay, so they bully him, him into flipping. He added that his testimony would then be a lie. He says, okay, fine. You want me to testify? I'll testify, but it's not going to be the truth. The meeting ended and the parties went into the courtroom. Now, the court never assured that this Brady evidence would go to the defense and Brady evidence includes the fact that the meeting occurred in the first place. Never assured that this Brady material, the exonerative material, made its way out. Instead, this court takes the position that no information about this meeting should have ever been revealed at all to no one outside the meeting. This shows this court has become a member of the government's team and that my client does not have a right to a fair trial. We have a right to present a defense. We have a right to cross-examine witnesses. We have a right to know about court intimidation 
of witnesses. And so this court must be recused. This court and the prosecution have violated his rights. We have to have a mistrial here. The state goaded Mr. Williams into moving for this mistrial of the court. So we had to bring this claim. And we also know on Monday afternoon, once we made this known to the court, the court refused to release the transcript of the meeting. And they held this lawyer in contempt. They ordered Mr. Williams lawyer to serve the maximum time in custody. And they attempted to intimidate him from understanding and learning about the prosecution's wrongdoing. And so this court has become a material witness in this case, as have the prosecutors. The improper ex parte meeting with a sworn witness concerning the witness's willingness or non-willingness to testify is unforgivable. This is not an ex parte meeting that the court has had with the affiance ever. You've never met with us. On the very few occasions that we've ever had an ex parte hearing with this court, we announce in open court, you need to speak with the court ex parte. We need to speak with you. We tell everybody about it. We don't just have private meetings. Never was a witness involved in any of these ex parte meetings because that's insane. Affiance demand, so defense team, we demand to question this court. We demand to question you and the above lawyers or the DA's office as to how many ex parte meetings you've had. If we found out about this one, how many others were there? The substance of those meetings, who was present and the like. It's like a shadow prosecution happening. Nobody even knows and the court's involved in it. Even if just one ex parte meeting occurred as it did, this mandates the court has forfeited its role as an impartial court and you must recuse. The court has on at least one occasion been fed improper ex parte information about this case. The court met with the witness, spoke to a witness about their willingness to testify and they didn't even notify us. The court has now placed the lawyer for Mr. Copeland and other unknown persons where they should come to court and testify. We should be able to answer questions for about all those nine people who were in that courtroom. The court has become the executive branch. They're conducting their investigation and they're pressuring this witness to comply. You falsely and wrongfully also accused Brian Man of Steel of being unprofessional and unprepared in front of the jury. Neither claim was close to the truth. The prosecutor sat silent and just said, <laughs> even knowing that the court has falsely accused Brian Steele of being unprofessional and unprepared, the court has refused to instruct the jury that that is not true. These are serious misstatements. He's following his ethical obligations and the court is smearing him in the midst of it. Now, when Mr. Copeland took the witness stand on June 7th, he refused to testify and he was taken into custody. And this court knew, as did the government, that his refusal to testify in front of the jury, they knew he was going to do that, but the court did not reveal that to anyone or take any actions to stop it. In fact, his refusal to testify in front of the jury prejudiced our client. The jury should have never heard him exercise his Fifth Amendment right. This court told the courtroom deputies to prohibit media from filming him, and the direction occurred before he took the witness stand. So the court is harming the defense by allowing this to go on this way. When Honorable David Botts brought to the court's attention that he had evidence that the prosecution knew Copeland was going to invoke, this court refused to have a hearing to determine if they knew. They just said that they had a problem with the attorney. This is backwards, okay, judge? This court has shown bias against Mr. Williams, his lawyers, in favor of the government. And so this court must be removed. In sum, says Brian Steele and the defense, this court has obstructed justice by ordering any transcript of your secret ex parte meeting to not be produced to the affiance, to use or to particularize. So we can't even read it. Facts of the case were also discussed with this court at this impermissible ex parte meeting and Brady evidence that would exonerate the defense was not even revealed to the defense. Mr. Williams, our client, has questions for this witness, this court, lawyers for the government, and others at this meeting. We want to know how it occurred, who discussed the fact that the secret meeting would occur, and the substance of this meeting so the jury can decide whether the court and the state have colluded against Mr. Williams. I swear that the above is true and accurate from Brian Steele and Keith Adams. Man, wow, just insane. You'd think it can't get any worse in Fulton County, and they're having a shadow prosecution that's being conducted by the judge in chambers. I mean, say what you will about Judge McAfee. I don't know. Did he meet with the government witnesses and try to also help them prosecute the defense? It's lunacy. This judge is actively involved in violating the defendant's rights, and it will be amazing to see where this goes. Currently, we know the judge has, guess what? Denied the motion to recuse himself, and apparently is not going to pass it off to another judge, as Mr. Steele, man of balls of, has asked happen. Upon a review of Mr. Steele's motion and affidavit, as well as Mr. Banks' motion and affidavit, that both contain assertions, bare assertions and legal conclusions, which aren't sufficient for the court to grant your motion at this point in time and refer it to another Just judge. Just bare for, accusations. For yeah, nothing. So I'm going to deny the motion at this oh, point you're in kidding. time. I invite you all to look at uh, Baptiste versus the state. Just because motions have, adverse rulings have been made doesn't mean that the court stops the, stops the trial. So I'm going to make that. I'll 
reduce both of the motions to recuse to an order, and I will file that so you can take whatever steps you need to necessarily yeah. after that. But I don't get into anything about the affidavit itself. Argument on that, I just have to read it. Those are the only three things I do. And then if I find it to be not sufficient on its face, I go for it. I just make the ruling at that point in time, let you all take it up. Take it up on appeal. So he says, I'm not going to even read it really and pass it off to another judge. I'm just going to say it's legally insufficient. And so it doesn't even meet the bare minimum standard threshold for me to give it off to another judge for them to consider. So I'm just going to deny it on its face. You guys are going to go have to appeal it. We know what happens in Georgia. They got to get permission for an appeal. And the question on this will also be, can they appeal it interlocutory right in the middle of this criminal trial? I'm sure they'll make that attempt. So we'll see what Brian Steele says because he is coming in hard on that. So we'll keep our eye on that one, my friends. Fulton County is bedlam. And as we do, as we cover all of this litigation and more, we'd love to have you join us here on our channel so that we don't miss you the next time we release something. Thank you for subscribing wherever it is you're watching us. Thanks for also inviting a friend or family member to come over here to our channel so that they can see what's inside these documents and what's happening in the various courtrooms around our country. We'll look forward to seeing you back here and them. And if you enjoyed this video, we've got a great video coming up next. We'll like to see you over there on that one next.